Hello, this video is for systematic theology on the doctrine of scripture, and I'm calling this one Authority Part 1. So there'll be two videos that go together for this one. And the first one I'm going to discuss authority as it relates to both canon as well as church. When we tend to think about canon, uh, often the sorts of things that immediately come to mind are those books that are included within the corpus of the Bible. So for Protestants, this is 66 books. Um, I want to suggest that that is a sort of a secondary element to what we mean by canon. Canon itself is a word that just simply refers to a measuring stick. So if you think about um, the sorts of things that go into a measuring stick, or the purpose of a measuring stick, is to give you an understanding of how other things hold up against it. We want to talk about those things that could be appropriately said in this case concerning God when we're talking about the Bible. What books of the Bible are, are enabling us to do that? When we speak of the Bible, we're meaning all these books are canon. So all these books belong to that measuring stick. Protestants, Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox all have the same core canon. Catholics have an additional 15 works of what's often known as the apocryphal texts, which are um, intertestamental Jewish texts. Uh, Eastern Orthodox have a few others as well, um, but in each case what they're trying to do is make a claim to authority. And ultimately the claim to authority is just this. What can we say concerning the nature of the biblical narrative? What is that biblical narrative? And what are those books that enable us to most appropriately speak of the biblical narrative? So if you remember this handy distillation of the biblical narrative, we have creation moving through fall, uh, lots of things obviously going on in the middle in the narrative. Then we have the reality of Jesus Christ, who we see as the climax in a certain sense, the, the purpose of the law, the purpose of Torah. And from him comes now that community, the church, whose goal is to bear witness to Jesus in multiple places, right? To go out from that central place of his, his work, his ministry, and his ascension, and to make his presence known elsewhere. They are, they are the vessels, in, in a sense, the church is supposed to be of the person of the Holy Spirit making Christ known. So in, in that sense, if we begin to think of canon in that kind of way, at least in terms of Christian canon, we can think in terms of the two Testaments, the Old and the New Testament, as both aspects of thinking of that. Right? The Old Testament is for the Jewish people, uh, the Hebrew scriptures. For them, it is the canon that is attesting to their identity as Jewish people, as a particular covenant given to earth, and the mechanism by which people are to know of Yahweh and himself revealed in his people. The, new, the Christian scriptures are meant to say that they are that, that is itself leading towards the ultimate culmination, which is in Jesus Christ himself. So to the degree that this canon, or rather that this narrative is being upheld, the different traditions of scripture put forth a canon. Protestants have long held the 66 books, which is in some sense hearkening back to the earliest tradition there were always a few books that were potentially outside of canon that people debated so for instance the book of hebrews it was never quite clear who wrote it so should it be canon or shouldn't it there's been some debate from time to time on second peter is it the same author as first peter is it the same peter um, there's been concerns over books like james is that offering a different sort of gospel than what Paul is offering. And ultimately the church everywhere has determined that no, these things, are, these, these apparent problems are not problems enough that they undermine the overall sense of the narrative. They add to it in an appropriate sense. They give clarification where clarification is needed and they enable us to be able to speak more clearly of the nature of this narrative. And therefore the church has held whichever precise canon it has that these texts, these books of the Bible are intended to be just that, declares of authority. So what I really want to put forth here is that canon at the end of the day is not just a statement about which books the Bible are in, which ones are out, but it is itself a declaration of authority. What books do we turn to to be able to authoritatively decipher what it is God has done, is doing, and will be doing? What books do we turn to to authoritatively determine what it means for us to be the church here and now? And what books are it that enable us to authoritatively decipher what our relation to other people, especially the Jewish people, are with regard to God's revelation? So when we think of the Old Testament, um, of course it begins with creation, but very little is actually said about creation, as we know. Instead, it's the broader setup for the drama of redemption. 
So even in terms of the Jewish canon, uh, the Jewish Hebrew scriptures, where they don't think in terms of Jesus, they're still thinking of the scriptures of the Old Testament as we know them to be primarily a declaration, not precisely of creation, but of what the special act is that God has done in creating the Jewish people and his purposes and refining them and his purposes and making them into a community that's supposed to testify that this is Yahweh's world. So bringing up the redemption uh, within the Christian drama, we think of the drama of redemption in the Old Testament that's setting up ultimately the New Testament, which is the drama of Christ himself. Now, our question that we ultimately want to deal with here then is what is the relationship of this same authority? So we're thinking authority again to the church. We have, we'll speak in terms of Western theology of two primary motifs. There's that of the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church tends to see authority as vested, of course, ultimately in scripture, but in terms of interpretive authority, thinking in terms of scripture as creature of the church. So I want to spend some time explaining what that means. But first, hopefully you'll see right here what I'm trying to do. This notion of authority here is less about what precisely is in, right? This isn't first and foremost about canon, but it's ultimately about meaning. And related to meaning, interpretive authority. and not first and foremost about some sort of ontological makeup. So what exactly is being done in terms of interpretive authority? Well, I would argue that for whether you're talking about Protestant, Roman Catholic, or Eastern Orthodox, the question is always about I erased too much. The question is ultimately about apostolic succession. So when we think about Roman Catholic theology in which they're saying that the church, or the, sorry, scriptures are a creature of the church, what they're saying is that apostolic succession ultimately lies within the church itself. Specifically, Roman Catholic theology affirms that apostolic succession comes through an unbroken line of Roman bishops, beginning with Peter to whom Christ gave the keys and the declaration that upon this rock my church shall be built. So see Matthew 16, verses 18 to 19. Scripture as the testimony of the apostles always needs interpretation. So see, for instance, the book of Luke in chapter 24, where the disciples needed Jesus to be able to tell them what the Old Testament was about, or Philip and the eunuch in Acts. Scripture is creature of the church, then, to the extent that the magisterium under the headship of Peter's unbroken line, now visible in the Pope, has been placed in its position to offer authoritative interpretation of Scripture. And we'll see more about, about the working out of that in my second mini-lecture for part two. Tradition, as the authoritative magisterial interpretation, magisterial interpretation of Scripture, does not stand above Scripture, Indeed, tradition comes first since it is the collection of prophetic and apostolic, sorry, scripture comes first since it is the collection of prophetic and apostolic writings. However, since tradition authoritatively interprets scripture, it is the authoritative lens through which we look at scripture, and in a sense is more current than scripture. However, all tradition is authoritative because it derives from scripture. So if you could visualize this, for the Catholic Church, scripture and tradition are like two hands or a 1A and a 1B to apostolic succession's authority. Both of them receive their, their character from the fact that they, re they receive themselves from God. On the one side, you have scripture, which comes as that collection of testimony of the apostles. On the other side, you have tradition that comes through um, the apostolic succession, through the formation of the church through the papacy, through the handing down of the keys of Peter. Again, more on that one to come. What tradition's job is then as 1B is to come underneath 
scripture and to interpret it so that the rest of the world can understand what's going on. Now, what's key here is think about something Thomas Aquinas would have said. Nothing below ontologically, ontologically can ever interpret something above. So the world is not in and of itself able to, through its own reasoning and philosophy, understand properly what's going on in scripture. What it needs is this mode of the magisterium of the church through its traditions to tell you what scripture is saying. In other words, tradition is a hermeneutical key, and it is a successful hermeneutical key to the degree that it is tied to the special authority granted the church magister magisterium through the papacy, and the papacy receiving its authority from Peter. In other words, tradition doesn't come before scripture. It doesn't supplement scripture in the sense of giving you something in addition. What it does is it interprets scripture, and it can lead you beyond scripture in the sense that it gives you implications not new stuff altogether. So it's helping you understand what scripture is leading towards. So scripture, the scriptures are what they are on account of their being collected, upheld, and interpreted by the church. Thus scripture is creature of the church since its meaning is bound to the church's being and reading. And the church, most properly, is constituted by the magisterium since the church is where the magisterium is administering the person and work of Jesus, especially in the sacraments. Now, how about Protestantism? Obviously, Protestantism is pretty varied, so we're not giving you everything. But in Protestantism, generally speaking, the notion is that the church is creature of the written word or scripture. Um, in, script, in, in Protestantism, there's this adage of sola scriptura. Sola Scriptura is itself a principle in which Scripture is itself the means of apostolic succession. So apostolic succession didn't go away, it's now bound within Scripture. And it becomes the means, the instrumental means by which the Spirit draws together the body of Christ, which is the Church. Traditions and councils are generally helpful interpretive lessons, and yet they do in time, at times err. Scripture remains as the authoritative and normative tool that God has chosen to call and shape his church. So scripture can and sometimes does challenge traditions and councils. Note, however, that sola scriptura historically was not a principle independent of tradition. Rather, it was a challenge to the hermeneutical primacy of tradition's authority. The Protestant reformers still abundantly appealed to tradition. In fact, they would often treat it in a way as if to say, look, we're not making this stuff up. Such and such church fathers said X. Note, too, that the sola scriptura principle did not solve the hermeneutical question of whose interpretation should count authoritatively. The fact that we have and can speak of the Protestant reformations in the plural is a historical testament to interpretive disagreement right away. The value of sola scriptura, then, is not in an interpretive presumption, but rather the call to return to the biblical narrative repeatedly and in the company of the diverse places of creation and the church to refine our being in the world. It is a call to hermeneutical triangulation where the constant is the text as God's communicative act, not our social location or that of Christian traditions. So if you think of triangulation, we have scripture as the voice or the, the means, the normative means of God's communicative act. We have um, us as those who stand here and we have traditions. Both us and traditions are socially bound things that belong in place. Scripture itself comes through a socially bound reality, but the goal here is to say that we have this socially bound reality. Can we begin to speak in terms of a humility of our boundness and tradition's boundness so that we're in interaction with each other as we begin to look to scripture, mutually edifying? That's the idea that we're at play here with triangulation. Um, still, sola scriptura is not a rejection of our social location. It is merely the reminder of the ongoing interpretive project from which every one of us is sharpening ourselves in Christ through the mutual edification that should exist among the various places that constitute the church as, an, as essentially unity and diversity. In my humble opinion, the call should not be toward the goal of uniformity of interpretation. Rather, it should be a call towards a recognition of the importance of plurality rather than a fear of plurality and the ability to sharpen each other so that the constant of scripture can remain authoritative.